Welcome back from another fun together time. I just love all the creative activities and conversation and let's not forget the awesome prizes, especially this last one. I know when I was a kid, boy, croquet was one of this, my favorite summertime activities and I hadn't thought about it in a long time. So I think I'm gonna run out and get a croquet set and uh, put it in my backyard and use it this summer. And congratulations to the winner. Thanks so much for joining us for this session on integrating financial education into wellness and professional development programs. I'm Teresa Pop Braun. I'm the regional director in the Midwest for our Center for Education and Financial Capability. And that means that I have the very great pleasure of serving our member law schools and our partner schools in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin. And our max financial education program and wellness are two of my all time favorite topics. So I am really super excited to be moderating this session. We were discussing before we went live. I'm also an avid herb gardener and I love to cook. So I thought our mini garden box was the perfect complement. Also a great analogy with this wellness topic, because when I cook, I try really hard to combine different complementary herbs into something that's gonna result in a delicious fit dish of food that people wanna eat. And I think that the wellness components can also and, and should combine in a really beautiful way to help us achieve our holistic health and well-being. And the programs you're gonna learn about today during our time together have successfully integrated financial education into both professionalism activities and wellness programming. And we have um, an amazing panel with us today. We have Megan Gabrielson, who is the Senior Student Affairs Coordinator at the George Washington University Law School, representing Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law. We have Christina Wilhelm Nelson, who's the Director of Financial Aid. And from our friends at Howard University School of Law, we have Adrian Packard, Who's, our, who's the Director of Student Affairs. And Megan is going to talk about Wellness Week at GW Law. And then Christina will talk about the Lawyer Wellbeing Week that they hold at Villanova. And Adrian will round us out with the way that they use financial education in their pathways to professionalism program, programs at Howard Law. So I will go ahead and, oh, before we get started, one quick housekeeping detail. If you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring that as the moderator and we'll have some time at the end where we will address your questions. So I'll go ahead and toss it over to Megan to get us started. Megan. Thank you so much, Teresa. It's wonderful to be here today and to get to speak to everyone. Um, as Teresa mentioned, I'm going to talk about Wellness Week here at GW Law. So we actively promote wellness in a variety of ways. We hold micro microprogramming sessions throughout the year to provide touch points, facial recognition for our office. And we have a very large student population. Our 1L classes are typically over 500 students. Um, so it's important for our students to make sure they know who we are. And one of the biggest programming efforts we do each and every semester is our Wellness Week. We offer uh, events that target as many of the wellness well, wellness wheel, there we go, uh, areas as we can fit into our week and capping the week off with a wellness fair for relaxation and de-stressing activities. Uh, I usually pick a week, e week each semester to plan a variety of activities and programming. And I'll always work with our SVA wellness committee to get a feel for what the students want or need in every semester. The very first thing they ask for is a financial wellness workshop or two. Um, I usually work with the uh, area law firms to sponsor some lunches to entice students to attend these workshops. But I also found um, during the pandemic, when I can't offer food, I still had very high attendance for all of our events. We tried to plan it for noon and 5 p.m. so we can get our daytime students and our evening students. And let's see. Uh, we have a program here called Foundations of Practice, which is a voluntary professional development program. One of the requirements to earn a dean's recognition for professional development is the students 
must attend a wellness program and the financial workshops are a great way for students to earn their credit and learn some lifelong skills. And as you can see here, we mix out what sessions we offer each semester and academic year from year to year. I get a list of the workshops uh, available from Jennifer Justanza, our rep, thanks Jen, and we send along to the students to pick at least one. And I usually recommend others that I know have been well received in the past, usually the credit one. Um, sometimes Jen will hype one that is new or she knows we haven't done in a while or has been really popular, but we've just never done it. Uh, and then one of our initiatives that I'm going to undertake this upcoming academic year is I'm going to start coordinating more efforts with our financial aid office to boost attendance by our upper class students. And I hope to start incorporating some programming into our orientation events. So that's a summation of Wellness Week at GW Law. I'm going to pass this over to Christina uh, for her part. Thanks so much, Megan. Um, at Villanova Law, we integrated financial wellness into our Lawyer, lawyer Wellbeing Week. And our Lawyer Wellbeing Week happens in January of every year, and we typically switch up the programs that are offered. So it's mandatory for our 3Ls to attend, and we also allow our 1L and 2L students to attend one of these classes or all. It's up to It's completely up to them. So a lot of our students would stop into my office and talk about how they wished they knew a little bit more about financial wellness. And based on the amount of questions I received about that, I decided to ask if we could incorporate a financial wellness class or program into Financial Wellness Week. So they allowed me to do that, and that was three years ago, and it was the before times, so we were able to have it in person. And with this with this financial or with our well-being week, the topics, programs, and workshops change every single year. So that's really why I think I was allowed to, to incorporate this class in um, the same year that I asked. And we ended up having the largest attended program of all of the programming since they incorporated uh, wellness week at the school. So now, even though all the other classes and programs change, the financial literacy wellness program will always be a staple for this week. And we market it to all of our students, which I think is really important because this program hits on so many topics to help our students that aren't just based on loan repayments and so forth. It's really just about how they can save money while they're in school, how they can budget, what to do after they graduate. It's just, I end up taking notes when I attend these because I'm actually learning things here as well. So I have had students after every single one of these programs, we've done it for three years now, come to my office and tell me how much they learned, how much they wish they would have had this starting their 1L year. So now we are also incorporating this into our orientation program. And we're also doing one for our 2L students, but it has gotten the most positive feedback of any of the programs we have, we have done at the school so far. And they also reached out to the Dean's offices to let them know that, that this was just a great program, something they learned a lot from. And like I said, now it's, it's a staple at the school. So our sessions are recorded for any students who can't make it, but we're at a point now where tenants typically for one of these programs during Wellness Week is about 20 students. This past, um, this year we were able to hold it in person and we had over 75 students show up uh, to the Financial Wellness Week and it was, it was fantastic to see all those students there and so many of them stopped and asked questions after and because of that and because they have been doing this in the prior years we incorporated one-on-one -on -one financial coaching with access lex with uh derek from access lex and he allowed coaching slots prior to our program prior to the program and then after so i decided to send out uh, the invitation for students to sign up for one-on-one -on -one coaching just to our three l's in case 
they wanted, they filled it up, but I was kind of doubtful. And we ended up filling up all of the coaching slots within seven minutes of me sending out, out the, the time slots. So Derek was kind enough to incorporate a few more time slots. So we know for next year, we might have to, to keep the speaker for two to three days because it was so popular. I was getting email after email from students who weren't able to sign up for one of these time slots. So we're definitely going to either have to shorten them or, or add a few more people for, for this upcoming year because that was as well received as our actual program. So like I said, we get so much amazing positive feedback. These programs are so well attended. And I just feel fortunate that that Villanova took a chance and allowed me to kind of slip this into Wellness Week. And, and it's been, like I said, the most popular program that we've put on so far. So um, that's that's how we do it at Villanova. So I think everybody is excited to hear from Adrian and what she's doing at Howard with financial education and their professionalism program. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Christina. Um, so yes, we are, uh, we kind of took an approach at Howard to incorporate wellness um, into our overall professionalism program. So our Pathways to Success program is a program that we, we market to students as how to become the best like lawyer, which includes looking for things in your career, but also self-care, um, financial fitness, what things are necessary for you to have the best and most optimal life in your career. And so we were really, uh, our first year was before Access Lex um, had the MAX program available to us. And we were floundering trying to find good programming that supported our students' um, needs as far as financial education. And so I uh, I think I had my first meeting ever with Jen Schott and, and Lissa Thaden. <laughs> it came to my office and I was like, it was like manna from heaven. It was like exactly what I needed offered and available to our students. So we um, incorporated our financial planning into the overall professionalism program that we run. Um, so. In our sessions, we, we operate pathways sort of like a CLE, um, and they get different sessions from different one of six categories. Um, and the speakers are usually alumni or um, people from the field. We consulted with a lot of people when we developed a lot of the programming for the overall program. And then we came up with um, uh, this program where they have, they get 10 points per session. And if they've gotten 200 points by the end of the year, which is 20 sessions through both semesters, um, then in five out of six competencies, then they have completed the program. So here we are. So one of the six categories is financial empowerment, but it's also we talk to students about building their brand, um, getting information to expand their knowledge about the industry, their personal and emotional health, strengthening their professional judgment, and then giving back to community. So we use I think almost exclusively access Lex programming for the financial empowerment category. Um, and then in addition to the sessions that are within Pathways, Pathways is really kind of focused on first year students. We repeat everything each year. So often when the first year students have completed it, they don't come back, but we still have some second year students that, that complete it. We found some of the sessions that might be more relevant to our third year students. If they see the word Pathways, they won't come <laughs> because they think, oh, we've already done that before. So some things we specifically don't include in Pathways um, just so that we can ensure that we get the third year students. And um, I think we'll get to a later slide where I'll show you yes, the list. So we started orientation, which was the easiest way we kind of introduced the Pathways program at orientation. And we also hold our first of our Access Lex programs during that week. So we've been doing, we did building your law school budget this year as our first session during orientation. And we give everyone points for that session, even though it's part of mandatory orientation. So they start the year already starting ticking away towards getting to completion of the program. Um, another thing that students get when they complete the overall pathways program, actually, I'll wait, I think that's in another slide. So we have, um, no, that's it. They, if they complete the program, they're also entered into a drawing for a $5,000 scholarship. And so the things that you get when you come to any pathway session is lunch, usually. Um, in a virtual world, we sometimes even gave uh, order codes for Uber Eats or DoorDash. Um, you get the beautiful information, and then also you get another entry towards completion. And everyone who completes is entered into a $5,000 scholarship 
um, award at the end of the year. So we hold two mandatory sessions that are part of orientation, which is building your law school budget. And this year we also did the credit and debt management for the spring orientation. Then we hold sessions throughout the year. Um, our attendance has been really great for professional um, programs in general, but our Access Lex programs are always really well attended. We also have one-on-one -on -one coaching similar to Villanova. Um, for every time that Access Lex comes to Howard for Max, we hold sessions before and after the lunch hour. So students can sign up for that morning or that afternoon. And then we encourage them to do one-on-one -on -one sessions at any time on their own. So we have um, been very grateful. We also include the Road to Zero, which is not on this list, as one of the mandatory 3L clearance options for graduation. We, we use that for the financial uh, their loan count counseling. And our students love Max. <laughs> they love Jennifer DeSanza. Um, and they participate pretty heavily. So because we've incorporated this as part of our overall picture of what financial fitness is, what a fit lawyer is, um, the students kind of have engaged and we haven't had any more trouble with them attending this than any of the other sessions that we hold. So that's the gist of our session. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, we do have several questions that came in. The first one I think is for anyone on any and all of you on the panel, if you would like to have it or uh, address it. And one is, what would you say were, were the major challenges, if any, of getting started? Because we get this question a lot from newer Mac schools and um, someone's asking, what, what would you consider the major challenges to getting started in to integrating financial education the way each of you have at your schools? So maybe we'll start with you, Adrian, since you were just finished. And then if, if uh, Christina or Megan want to chime in afterwards, that'd be great. Sure, that's great. Um, I think it was really helpful for us to incorporate it as part of orientation. Um, that's when they're very much a captive audience. <laughs> they pretty much all show up to orientation. And so they've had their first taste of, of the MAX program um, when they arrive. And so that foundation was laid. Also, I think incorporating it in the same, it has the same weight as a session with a big firm about going into tech law or um, a session from alumni about interviewing skills or finding a mentor. And so we create a kind of equal importance for our students and talk about how this is one of the six categories we've identified that help you be the best lawyer you can be and have the best practice. I, I tease my students all the time and I can say, you could be you know, the best litigator in the world, but if you can't put gas in your car to get to the courtroom, that's not helpful to you. And so we talk about financial fitness from the beginning um, and why it's really important to, to have your finances in order. We also um, try to make sure that this, <laughs> I picked early sessions that I think will really pull the students or we market them in a way um, that might be really enticing. Um, for example, when we talk about which one session that was that we did, um, sorry, I'm gonna just look at this here. When we did the one about like finances as it relates to the bar, students filled that with droves, right? Because they were concerned about bar admission and so they wanted to come. So for us getting started was really easy because we were looking for financial programming for students to incorporate into our program we already had existing but each year getting the students to engage and to sign up um, starting them in orientation has been really helpful and then reiterating it with the spring orientation so that even if you didn't come to any programming during the first semester you're reminded of this program the last thing that i'll say has been helpful to us that may not be as helpful to everyone else is i think in our second year we had a student win one of the max scholarships and so I'm often teasing the students that, you know, like we win. And then this year, one of our students, the first year won a 5,000, this year we won a $25,000 scholarship. So, um, but for the last three years in between, I was just like, there's $40,000 out there. And that has been really helpful to get students engaged as well. Thank you. Yes, we've found that the scholarships are a huge incentive to getting students engaged. Megan or Christina, would you like to add anything or address that? same question, challenges to just getting started? We, uh, at Villanova, we had a student win the $20,000 scholarship. 
two years ago, and uh, that was a huge incentive for our students to sign up for Max, and we were really able to promote that among the students. Um, so we did see an influx of, of our students signing up for it. But when we host sessions and workshops and presentations from Access Lex, they are able to always incorporate how to sign up for Max while, for the students who are in attendance. And they usually do it at the end of the session and the sessions go over so well with the students and the students have feel like they learned a lot. And again, like every single session we've ever had, I've gotten really good positive feedback from those. And I think that that also helps the students get excited about signing up for Max. Then seeing someone win is helpful, but knowing also when you're signed up for Max that you get the individualized counseling whenever you need it. I'm seeing a huge uptick of our students who are taking advantage of that. And word of mouth is unbelievable here because they do, every person they've ever met with, our students have found them to be so helpful in anything that they're asking them um, that the students are promoting that amongst themselves. So that's been really helpful too. So with every positive program we have here, it allows me to hit up another department so I can kind of incorporate another program and then it just kind of spreads like that for us here. Well, we know, you know, Max is, this is our fifth year of Max and we do know that as, as departments collaborate, it just increases the touch points for the students and that's how, that's one of the major ways, one of the best practices for getting more students engaged. So it sounds like it's working, it's working perfectly at your school. Do you collect, like when you say you receive feedback, is it um, more like qualitative anecdotally or do you, you know, give them any type of official uh, survey or that type of thing to, to gather their thoughts? I haven't done any surveys yet. I just, so, so they come to me and they also go to our Dean suite with the feedback. So when we have our director and Dean's meeting, typically after we have had some sort of access less programming at the school, I am able to just discuss openly with the other members of the different departments within the college about what students have said. And then that is really helpful. So I haven't done any concrete, like I had 11 students, um, you know, like I just am able mm -hmm. to share feedback and that seems to be really helpful. It's a small, we're a smaller school. So um, word, word travels. And a lot of times the students who come and share their feedback with me will also share it with, with others too. So, so I found that that's all I've needed so far for, for me to be allowed to, to request and incorporate more programming into our school. Perfect. Yes. We, we also know that, that the peer, peer conversations are critical in, in getting other students involved. So awesome. Megan? Do you have anything to add in terms of the challenges or, or process for just getting started? Um, I, I mean, I agree. I have a lot of students who have attended them in the past and they end up being on the SBA wellness committee. So that's why they know about it. And they're like, hey, can we bring that back? I remember when I was a 1L, this is what I did. Um, and that's mostly how I get my request for the programming so much is from the students. Um, we also had a scholarship winner, but it was the very, very first time it was ever offered. So I feel I need to step my game up to kind of get us a, a new one to be, you know, refreshed. Um, so that's going to be now a goal for next year is to really motivate more attendance. Um, it does get hard. There, as a large law school, we have a lot of events going on any given day, especially coming out post pandemic and everyone's clamoring to be in person again. Um, so there are still times when it's it's still hard for me to get people, but food is always the biggest draw. And I know that can eat away at, at people's budgets, you know, in their individual offices and what they can provide, but you can find some workarounds or see if you can get someone to help you out with it, to just bounce it out. And I'm actually really looking forward to collaborating with other offices to bring more programming in next year 
to hopefully build our attendance even higher. Awesome. So I think a question that we have that that piggybacks nicely on on that one is in addition to the programs where it's required, like in orientation at Howard, how do you how do you specifically promote? What mechanisms do you use? Tools, marketing tools do you use, whether it's emailing, do you do anything with texting? Are there internal, you know, listservs? Is there a newsletter? If each of you could address how that how you communicate these opportunities to the students when they're not required. I'm happy to go first. Um, okay. So we, as I mentioned before, it's part of an overall program, right? That they have to do um, 20 sessions in order to complete. And so I think that helps with the motivation a bit. They know that it's a pathways program and they're gonna get the points. For marketing purposes, we have a weekly newsletter that comes out from my office that says what all the upcoming events are for the following week. And so we include it there. We also have monitors throughout the building and we we put fly, we make flyers and have them run on the monitors throughout there. But you know, another thing that I have found to be really helpful is I usually just try to find a student in the 1L class. They always have group me's. <laughs> and I say like, hey, make sure you drop the program in the group me this week. Um, or there's a school-wide group me and I might have my SBA um, put the information there. I have found that students listen to other students way more than they listen to me. And so sometimes that's a helpful way to get students to show up. Um, I've had times, maybe for a max program or maybe for something else where I was like, really wanted to make sure the students got the content and I didn't feel like enough were showing up where I have like walked through the hall on my way there and said like, are you hungry? Like you should come eat and just to get them in the room. Um, and I found that to be helpful too. But we normally market through our newsletter. Um, our, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, the Pathways program is a partnership between Career Services and the Office of Student Affairs. And so we have the Career Services Department has an Instagram page. They put the flyers for our events on the Instagram page. Um, and that usually gets the students in the door. Okay. Megan or Christina? I can Ways go again. That you Okay, perfect. Well, Adrian and I have very similar tactics for motivating students to come to the programming. So um, career strategies for the Wellness Week is, is the department who puts that on. So they communicate to the students um, about the programming and attendance and so forth. Then our office also sends out a separate email and then another reminder email to come to the financial literacy program. And then we put bullets in there about what is going to be discussed to make sure that the students who aren't borrowing financially, because about 15% of our students don't, don't utilize federal funding, that this will also apply to them, that this is not specific to those who borrow federal funding. And then I will talk to our president of the SBA and say, hey, spread the word. I'll find, like, we always have students in and out of our office. So then, you know, those of us in the financial aid department, or like anybody we're meeting with, don't forget about this. Come to this and we're gonna, well, we don't have any food during the wellness week, but for our other programming, we have pizza. And we're always like, don't forget, there's going to be pizza. One, and I forgot to mention this, one of the programs we had, we had ordered, Typically for any program, anybody puts on, regardless of, of Access Lex or, you know, another part putting on another program, we'll order seven to eight pizzas, anticipating anywhere from 10 to 25 students to show up. So I ordered eight pizzas. Those were gone before half of the students who came to attend the session even got pizza. I was monitoring, I'm like, one piece, one slice. So I had to run back, order eight more pizzas, and we had literally two slices of pizza left. That's how many students came to, to that program too. So food is another motivating factor. It works wonders for our starving students. Yes, food is always an attraction, so. Megan, ways that you market the programs to your, your students? Uh, it seems that we're all on the same page in how we market. Um, we have a few different newsletters. So we have our SBA newsletter. So I always make sure I get it to them. We also have the digital boards. We have, um, 
one new newsletter that we started this year called Keeping It Brief. It was like a snapshot of like everything from different departments in the week. We have another one that's like the GW Weekly Five, and sometimes my events would be highlighted in there. Um, we have an internal, virtually as our portal, which is our Blackboard, and I'll post something up there. And then the SVA has their uh, social media pages, so I always work with them to get them to promote all of our um, events, whether it's the financial planning or any of the other ones as well. And I literally go around and put billboards up on 37 bulletin boards all over the law school and in key places that I know students will see, including at, you know, at our front desk. That way anybody comes in, we're like, hey, are you going to be at the program later today? Like, there will be lunch. Um, so, yeah, I definitely try to offer the food. That definitely gets them in. Great. And we have, speaking of bulletin boards, we have awesome materials in our Max Communications Toolkit. So the flyers you can put up, lots of digital pieces that you can share with all of your students is an, uh, they're another great way to market. So someone has asked, for those of you who make this kind of programming mandatory, how did you do that? And do you, did you or do you have to involve faculty approval? So Adrian, maybe we'll go to you first on that one, if it's okay, since it is required as part of your orientation. Sure. So the entirety of orientation is mandatory um, for our students. Now they sneak out sometimes and like stand in the back. Most of it's in the auditorium, so it's easy to keep them in the moot court room. Um, so that one's easy. For the road to zero that we do for the three L's, I don't clear them to graduate until they've shown they completed it. So <laughs> they all always complete that one. Um, and then throughout the school year, I don't, I have a lot of trouble with mandatory. I don't really make much mandatory, but the two, the fall and the spring orientations, the entire session is mandatory. So there hasn't been anything where I had to work with the faculty. Um, and I'm lucky in that, um, orientation is kind of my oyster. So if I put it in there, then it's happening unless there's some problem. Um, I think if I wasn't in charge of student affairs, it would be, I would probably still try to work with whoever's in charge of orientation to get the first session in there. I like to try to catch a thing where I know almost the entire class will be there so that I know they've received it. And then I pick a session that if they don't come to anything else, we really wanna make sure that they've gotten um, this introduction. So a follow-up to that that we received is how long is your orientation? Yes, so I actually, our orientation is a week, but it incorporates um, as uh, like a pre-law kind of academic component that's the, half, the morning of five of those days. So I, I technically only have, for my programming purposes, we have a barbecue Wednesday afternoon, and then Friday they get out early to prepare for a pending ceremony we do later that evening. So I really only have three half days worth of programming available. Um, the other five halves of days are for class, and then once barbecue, once go home and get dressed. So I have three half days worth of time to get it in and we do a one hour session every year for the spring orientation it's one day it's usually um i might some years i end before noon <laughs> depending on whether i'm buying lunch um and some years i end around two or so and those ones we usually do also like a 45 minute session just because i have a little less time um but that's the length of time i have oh. okay So another question we received is from one of our pre-law advisors who's with us this afternoon. And the question is, is there an, one actionable item that you might suggest for pre-law advisors or programs that can be taken to address these issues prior to the students matriculating in law school? Anyone? I can jump again. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm always talking, so I don't. <laughs> okay. the first thing, I I I know that there are some pre-law sessions that um, Access Lex has through their website that I'm not as familiar with, just because I don't work with pre-law students as much. So I would recommend looking at those because they might be really helpful. Um, one of the things that I think is important for my students, I I like the sessions related to debt um, and debt management, not only because they're going to op most students. Um, I'm, I was, you know, really excited about 15% of students having no, I have one or two students that graduate without financial aid. It's a good year. Um, so 
I like them to be prepared to manage the debt they're going to have, but also because debt and um, any issues you have with finances can become a character and fitness issue after graduation. I think that if you were going to pick one thing to, to start to talk to your incoming or future um, students about, that one's really good. But I, there's some sessions on like um, how to think about your law school career as it relates to your finances that I think are really helpful. Um, I find with my first year students who are not too far off of being pre-law, that they can sometimes be shifted into career choices because of what they think the financial implications of those are and really understanding them fully can help a student decide whether to go to law school or what type of law to pursue. So that would personally be my recommendation. And I think I could add to that an actionable item for pre-law advisors would be to direct your students to our Max Pre-Law. So they would create an Ask Edna account just like the law students do. And when they enter, they can go into Max Pre-Law. We have lessons, we have webinars, they can get one-on-one -on -one coaching just like the law students can. And we focus on many topics, but the ones that pertain to the conversation we're having here this afternoon would be the paying for law school and budgeting for law school. So they can um, talk a little bit about that, learn more about it. And um, we're also developing and, and are launching a new uh, session on the return on investment for uh, that'll be targeted to pre-law students. So have them check out Max Pre-Law, which they can access through our uh, Ask Edna account. And like all of our resources, it's completely free. Let's see, we have so many questions. I don't wanna miss any here in the chat panel. Um, let's see. Do, do any of you do any sessions that deal uh, at, in your wellness uh, wheel that deal with what it might be like to default on a loan or pursue bankruptcy? as a way to both um, destigmatize these events as well as maybe just put them out there in the universe as a cautionary tale. So I can kind of speak to that. Um, that is actually a talking point in the session that we do during the, in the financial literacy session that we do during Wellness Week. So each time we held this, the session's relatively same each year, and that's definitely addressed. And I think that it's addressed in a way where the students truly understand how they will be impacted in so many ways if they do end up defaulting. And we also do exit counseling programming prior to the student um, graduating. These are, this is specific to the three L's where we spend about 15 to 20 minutes in an hour long session discussing the, just what will happen to a student if they end up going into default. So we try to address that at the end and we address it in the beginning as well. And it'll be addressed during our orientation when we have a financial program uh, during our orientation week. So we're going to hopefully add that into, into the program. Like um, the presenter, I'm sure will speak about that. It's so important nowadays because it can affect you in so many ways. So that is something that, that we definitely try to discuss as often as possible at Villanova. Great. Thank you, Christina. Does anyone, either of you have anything else to add to that question? And yeah, so the only thing I could add is I love that idea and I'm going to steal it and start incorporating it into some of our programming. So thank you for asking the question and to Christina for answering it. I used to work with a colleague that always said I steal shamelessly. So it's a good thing. No, no reason to reinvent the wheel. And, and that's why we're here to get good ideas from to learn from each other and to get good ideas from each other. Speaking of good ideas. Oh, cool. Can I just add one thing to the last comment is I, we don't really talk a lot about that in programming, but one thing that I do point out when I have had students have that issue or we're concerned about it is the one-on-one -on -one coaching, I think is really helpful um, to have really specific conversations about per, pe, student individual needs. So I don't know if that's helpful, but encouraging students to use one-on-one -on -one and maybe using that as a hypothetical 
um, when you're talking about the one-on-one -on -one sessions and introducing the program will drive students who might have that issue there, even if they have it now or later. And we do, and we love having our one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with students. So please continue to send them our way and to schedule them at your schools. Question, what's one thing you might want to uh, do differently or try for next year's programming? Any thoughts there? So one thing I'll say is that we we were actually part of like a pilot group when Max was being formed. So we are five years in with Max and um, we've done changing a lot, a lot. We've switched our sessions around sometimes based on what we think might be most relevant. I know some of the sessions have changed over time. Um, so I think the only thing that we might change again for this year is just how we're engaging the students in between sessions. Um, and making sure that we're really focusing on the one-on-ones. We've had years where they've been, I think COVID has made that a little harder more recently because we used to physically be here and we would fill the day. Um, and now uh, students are like, don't wanna be on campus. And so I think last time Jennifer was here, she did two in person and the rest were on Zoom. And so just trying to figure out how to, to move differently in this kind of semi-remote world that we find ourselves in. Megan or Christina, anything to add there? Something you might do differently for the coming year's program? Honestly, I would just add the more programs and I wouldn't change our financial literacy program at all right now because it is honestly so well received. I couldn't imagine enhancing it any more than it already is. But again, and I keep repeating myself and I apologize for that, but the programs that we have instituted here have been so beneficial to our students that adding more is the only thing that, that I would change. We like more. I so will echo question. that wholeheartedly, Liz. I definitely would like to add more, um, whether it's summer programming or just throughout the academic year. I'm definitely interested in adding more and more and more programming. Well, we have so much in Max and all our wonderful web webinars and resources. We can help you with that, Megan. One thing I thought I just thought of that I forgot to mention earlier, and I'm sorry about that, is I actually start to introduce Max before my students get here um, in their summer introductory letters. I send them the calculator to calculate their loans, like through uh, Max and to kind of build budgets using the Max program. So I, um, I might focus on that a little bit more this year, but that is something else that I do to help kind of get the students introduced to it. So when they come for orientation, they've heard of what Max is already at least. So a question that came in in a couple of different, um, it came in in a couple of different questions, but it was written a little differently, but essentially it, it boils down to if you have a comprehensive wellness program, especially through, uh, I know that uh, there's a SBA wellness committee, what other types of programs are offered that pertain to the wellness wheel beyond the financial education piece, especially with the, in coordination with the SBA uh, wellness committee? So I'll, I'll jump on that one because I'm the, I probably work with them the most. Um, we have a huge student org population. We actually have four student organizations that deal with physical activity. So we try to partner with them to do that physical wellness aspect, whether it's yoga club leading yoga or the running club. We did some runs with the Dean because she apparently is a runner. I am not. Um, so she's led some runs down the national mall. Um, we work with our DC Lawyers Assistance Program, DC LAP, to do a panel at least once during Wellness Week. And the one that is requested by my L Wellness Committee is about addiction. So they like to have um, counselors and pe uh, lawyers in recovery come and speak on a panel to discuss like their roads to recovery and things to overcome. Um, who, I'm trying to think who else we brought in. We've had a nutritionist come in. We've done virtual uh, nutritionist panels as well. 
we have our wellness fair, which is my favorite thing that we end the wellness week on, which is kind of, they can come, they can color, they can make origami, stress balls, clean their laptops. And trust me, that's the thing they want to do the most because by that point in the semester, their laptops are pretty gross um, because they've been studying, they've been eating, they've been taking notes and they, they love to come and, and clean, clean their laptops. So that's kind of the programming I do. And I'm always open to new ideas and whatever the uh, wellness committee comes up with, we try to brainstorm some ideas. We've done raffles, made people submit recipes and students could win something if they were had the best recipe. Um, we got really creative during the pandemic on the different kinds of programming that we need to pull together for a wellness week. That was one of the things I think that happened with most all of us trying to be a lot more creative during the pandemic to keep the engagement going and this keep the spirits up and and it sounds like your SBA committee comes up with a lot of great ideas. Any other um, type no. of program? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. I would I feel like our programming is very similar. Um, healthy eating and we have um we work with the DC Bar um, Blood Assistance and, and also our internal counseling center. Um, we don't particularly do a week of wellness. We have more like once a month, there's a pathways program that's wellness related. So the category for that is like, um, is developing a personal health and emotional intelligence is the category that we don't call it wellness necessarily. Um, but also we have, depending on class schedules, because I like to make sure there's classes before and after when we plan them, but we'll do either like Thriving Thursday or Wellness Wednesday once every month um, and hold sessions in there. So the session topics are very similar to what Megan listed, but we, um, and rather than a week, especially since COVID, because we said, well, we haven't had a wellness fair in a few years, <laughs> um, but we do it once a month. Okay, let's see. Outside of week-long programs, what kind of services or resources do you offer throughout the year uh, to support your students in their wellness efforts? And I know we just got done talking about specific, you know, holistic uh, wellness programming on, on the wheel. I guess what I would what I would add to that question is, do you set forth like a an annual academic year calendar? In addition to, I know you showed us that slide, Adrian, where you know you do it in the fall, you do it in the um, spring orientation, then you fill in pieces. Is that calendar set on an annual academic year basis? Um, and I, if each of you could address that, that would be great. And then if you if it is, or even if it isn't. Are there other services that you might incorporate with the either Access Lex programming or the programming you're doing with these, you know, the nutrition, the, the DC bar, the local bar, that kind of thing? Yeah, we set ours for the year uh, at the beginning of the year. I kind of advertise to the student per semester. So we plan it over the summer for the year. Um, I usually call Jen and lock in the dates from the beginning so we know when we're doing them. And they're on the, the pathways calendar for the year. Um, and then outside of that, we add, we might have um, the counseling center come to the law school during high stress times, or we might hold uh, uh, online like a Zoom session on managing stress during exams or that kind of thing. Um, so that might not be on the calendar for the year. I like to take the temperature of what's going on with the students and maybe add and sprinkle a few extra things. But our sessions that we have both with Access Lex, Max program and in any of the other wellness, as well as our building our brand, industry knowledge, all of those are planned for the year. And we publicize them through our Google Calendar that the students can, can see and add to their own calendars. Great. Anything else, Megan or Christina? We, um, our SBA sends out a monthly newsletter. And then um, within that newsletter, it highlights the wellness programs that they're they're putting on so very similar to what megan said uh they offer yoga they offer stress ball making they offer multiple like they do coloring they do health um the one thing that that the school also tries to um bring in for our students is lawyers concern for lawyers so they do programming with that organization here as well. And then they do 
they actually bring people in to help with personalized one-on-one -on -one counseling or set it up now post COVID, or I guess we're never going to be post COVID, but after we were fully online, um, now they're allowing the option of meeting via zoom or in person too. So, but mostly very similar with, with Adrian and Megan in that aspect. I know of one school that opened up a wellness room and it's not staffed by anyone. It just has activities in there that they can go in and do. It has beanbag chairs and you know, table. It has stress balls, a couple yoga mats, things they can read, things they can color. So it's just trying to get at all of those pieces in the, um, in the wellness wheel and make it a more comprehensive type of situation. We had a great comment from uh, Jill and she said, it would also be nice to have some of these activities coincide with law school mental health day, which for 2022 is gonna be October 10th. So mark your calendars, October 10th, 2022 is law student mental health day. We should all plan some serious programs for that day. Okay, let's see. What would be your top tip? for an administrator who is just starting to build a program like the ones that all of you have. Active, successful, student buy-in. If you could give the, an administrator one tip, what would it be? And if you could each address that, that'd be great. How about we'll start um, with you, Christine, since you're, yeah, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> sorry. We have a little delay on the on the on twenty four, so we're kind of moving around. And, um... Um, this is this is going to sound really far off, probably than what any expected answer is. But what I found um, to help the most is an engaging speaker that keeps the students. They they that gets them energized and what they want to talk about the program with their peers after. So I am terrified to speak in public. It took a lot to get me to do this. I could never do a presentation in public and have anyone walk out saying anything positive. They'll just be like, what was that? But um, having like the Access Lex speakers know what they're doing and it's such a vast difference from any workshops we put on versus a professional type of presentation because there's so much energy, there's so much engagement, and there's so much buzz afterwards. So whatever particular program you're looking at, which I highly recommend financial literacy, that seems to be the most popular here, um, just make sure the speaker is very engaging and full of energy because that's that's what garnered the most positive feedback for us. Great, Adrian. Sure, um, it's so hard to pick one. I think you're making me choose. <laughs> I would say get a student to kind of help with your buy-in. Um, I think that if you have the administrative support to put the programs on and the max makes it super easy. It has literally been the easiest of all the things I have to put together are my max programs. Um, so that's not hard, but if you can't get students in the room, you can't get them the information. And so having other students who believe in the program um, and who have won a scholarship or who um, just so that could be your SBA, it could be if you have a student assistant, but just getting students to kind of help you bring the other students and partnering with a student organization my, my top tip would be to kind of get other students to help you make inroads in the participation. Great. And we're so glad to hear that Max makes it easy for you. That's the objective. Megan, what would your tip be? My tip? Just go for it. Uh, if it doesn't work, you can revisit it, revamp it, reintroduce it later. If it works, great. You can build that hype as it goes on and on and on. Um, I always say every time that we're planning orientation or wellness week or any other program we do, it's most of the time the students have never done it before. So they don't know what to expect. It's you that has that expectation. So just jump in with both feet, hold your nose, just go for it. It's 
there's no downside to doing it. There's just, okay, that didn't work. Let me change things. Let me tweak this. Let me offer it this day instead of this day or this time instead of this time. And, and you can just keep going for it until you nail it and you get something that works for you. You know, that goes along with one of my life mantras, and I tell this to the students a lot of times, and it's if you don't ask the question, the answer is always no. So if you don't try the programming, you don't know what's going to happen. So it sounds like we have awesome programming going on, great tips for trying to motivate the students, ways to market to them, to innovate, to partner with other departments, and to try to get at this, this holistic wellness, and especially with the financial piece, which is a huge piece. You know, if we're not financially well, that will definitely impact other areas of that wheel. So, wow. So I have to make this one comment because Christina just shared her, her apprehension about speaking in public. And uh, Morgan said, you're phenomenal. Thanks for pushing through that fear to share this info with us. So, and in addition to Christine, I, I would like you to all give virtual claps to all of them, Morgan, Christina, Adrian, for sharing all of their programmatic successes, a few of the challenges they've had, their knowledge being here with us today. Because as I say, we're going to learn from each other. We're going to share ideas. We're going to steal shamelessly. We're going to use things that we find and build on those and, and see what works at our institution. And we really, really appreciate all of you joining us. I tell the students all the time when they either come to a workshop in person when I'm at a school or when I do a webinar that there's opportunity cost to our money and we all know that, but there's also opportunity cost to our time. And so we're very appreciative that you've taken some of your time to be with us today for this really engaging session. Please don't forget to give us some feedback on the survey. At Access Lex, we take feedback very, very seriously. We, we read it all, we incorporate where we can and we act on it. And you can head back over to the hub for another exciting together time. But thank you again to all of our panelists today. We appreciate your time and your sharing and your expertise and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thanks so much. <laughs>